As we finish up our discussion of what statistics is and to get a feel for it, we're going to talk about collecting sample data today. The reason that we're talking about this completely separately is collecting sample data is incredibly important. It influences the quality of our statistical analysis and ultimately the reliability of our study. Simple random sampling is an incredibly important one that we'll be coming back to. We'll talk about what that is. And it's important to know that if we don't collect data well, we don't do it in an appropriate way to begin with, there's no saving it. There's no coming back from that a lot of times. So the method used to collect sample data, incredibly important, even though it comes so early in a statistical study. So there's a thing that we call the gold standard sometimes. It's the randomization with a placebo or treatment group. Um, that's like the best we think that we can do. Um, they call it the gold standard because it's incredibly effective. And just a uh, placebo in medicine, and a lot of times it's a sugar pill or like a saline injection. Um, but it's basically something that looks like the treatment, but is not actually the treatment itself. So some basics about collecting data. There's two basic types of statistical methods we can use. Um, we can do an observational study and we can do an experiment. So let's first talk about what an experiment is. This is where we apply some treatment and then proceed to, to observe its effects on individuals. So when we conduct an experiment, we have experimental units or subjects. Um, subjects if they're people, experimental units if they're some object or something like that. In an observational study, we don't do anything to modify the situation. We simply observe people or objects in their environment. So we're observing and measuring specific characteristics without attempting to. So in an experiment, we do something, we impose some kind of treatment. In an observational study, we simply observe things as they are without applying that treatment. So here's an example of a fairly famous statistical study. It's an observational study and they observed past data and concluded that ice cream causes drownings. It's based on data showing that there's increases in ice cream sales and increases in drownings. They're associated with one another. They both happen at the same time. But this is a mistake to think that one causes the other. What's really happening is there's a lurking variable of temperature. When it's warm outside, more people eat ice cream and more people swim, so more people drown. If we were to conduct this as an experiment instead of as that observational study, we would take two groups of people, we would give one of the groups ice cream and not give the other group ice cream, and then we would observe them and we would count how many people drowned from each group. In the experiment, if the group that ate ice cream had more drownings, then the results of the observational study, we would be able to have a little bit more legroom to say, hey, maybe these things are connected and there's not this underlying variable. So experiment is a much better method than an observational study in a lot of cases. However, they're not always ethical or possible. In education especially, we can't necessarily do experiments as readily as we can do observational studies. As we think about designing experiments, there's several things that we need to consider at, along the way. The first one is replication. Replication is the repetition of an experiment or more than one individual. This means that we're able to apply the same treatment to more than one individual along the way. 
A good use of replication requires that the sample sizes that are large enough so that we can see the effects of treatments. So we want to be able to re replicate whatever our treatment is, whatever our study is, to see these effects. Also, we sometimes talk about blinding with experiments. Blinding is a technique where the subject doesn't know whether he or she is receiving a treatment or a placebo. So we hand all of the subjects a pill and they don't know whether it's a sugar pill or the medication that's being tested. Blinding's a way that we get around the placebo effect. Inevitably, if we give a treatment to someone, they are likely to report that they have some kind of improvement in symptoms, even if the pill that we gave them was a sugar pill. It's a, called the placebo effect. And by doing blinding, we get around that a little bit and we can't account for that. In a double blind study, the subject doesn't know whether they're receiving a treatment or a placebo. And the experimenter also doesn't know whether they're giving the treatment or the placebo. So say you're giving a medication that's given through an injection. The person who is completing the injection, the person who's interacting with the subjects, that person doesn't know whether the syringe that they are using is full of saline or full of the medication. And the subjects don't know either. The only people who know are the ones conducting the statistical analysis. Finally, we've got randomization. Randomization is used when subjects are assigned to different groups through a process of random selection. So the idea here is that if we randomly assign subjects, then what we're going to do is end up with groups that are relatively similar to one another. Back to this idea of a simple random sample. We said that this was an important thing. A simple random sample is a sample of n subjects, so some number of subjects, that's selected in such a way that if I take the entire population and I look at all the possible groups of n people and subjects, then each of those groups has an equal chance of being selected. A lot of times people use the idea of a simple random sample and a random sample interchangeably. However, a random sample just says everybody in the population has an equal chance of being selected. That's actually different than the qualification for the simple random sample, and it's actually a little bit weaker. So when we say that we have a random sample, it's not as strong as saying that we have a simple random sample. Another way that we can do sampling is to do systemic sampling. What we do here is we say, you know what, I'm going to check every fourth, or in this case, every third vehicle, I'm going to check it. And that's going to be my sample. So systemic sampling says I'm going to choose a number, and every time I hit to that number, counting the subjects going through, I'm going to check that one. Convenience sampling is super common. It's using the data that are very easy to get. It's like me saying that I'm going to find out how students feel about something and I talk to only the students in my classroom because they're there in front of me and I don't have to go find students elsewhere. So doing the super convenient thing, the thing that's easiest to get the data, that's called convenient sampling. Stratified sampling, we subdivide the population into at least two different subgroups. So we can do male, female, we could do freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, we could do transfer students, we could do uh, race, uh, any, anything. All right, so we split people into these groups of 
And these groups have some kind of common characteristic, like there's a method to the separating into the groups. These groups are called strata, all right? And then we draw our sample from each of the subgroups. In doing so, what I do is I make sure that I have the same amount, the same representation from each of my strata, each of my subgroups. Yet another type of cluster. Yet another type of sampling is cluster sampling. In this one, what you do is you divide an area up into these sections or clusters, and then you randomly select the clusters you're going to go to, and you choose all of the members of the clusters. So you might say that you're going to break a school up into all of the classrooms. You're going to randomly select a couple of the classrooms, and then you're going to survey all of the students in those classrooms that you selected. Or in this case, we have a map, here's a city, and we've randomly selected three blocks within the city, and then we would go door to door and we would survey every single person on those blocks. One option that we have available to us is to do what's called multi-stage sampling. You can collect data by using some combination of those basic sampling techniques or sampling methods. And in this, pollsters select a sample at different stages, and at each stage, they can use the different technique. It doesn't have to be the same. Some of these sampling techniques that we've mentioned are not necessarily great ways to gather data, and some of them are great. And depending on the context of what we're trying to learn about, at different points, all of them could be appropriate. So just keep in mind that all of these things exist, and some of them may be better than others, and it's going to be context dependent at times. But really, simple random sampling, random sampling is, is something that we want to strive for whenever possible. Again, observational studies, we've already said that we observe and measure, but we don't do anything to change. So all of the sampling stuff we were talking about, that was all for experiments. Observational studies, we're not going to do any kind of modifying. We're not going to have the sampling to do. So our types of observational studies that we have are a cross-sectional study. In this, we're going to observe data and it's going to be all at once. So I would choose Monday to be the day that I'm going to ask everyone their favorite food. In a retrospective study, what we do is we say, you know what, I'm curious about this thing and there's data in the past that I can use to study it. So in a retrospective study, we ask questions and we go back in time and use records that we have from the past in order to study it. In a prospective study or longitudinal or cohort study, what we do is we're collecting data from the future from groups. And these cohorts, they have things in common and it can be something like they all started a job in the same year, they all started college in the same year, something like that. Um, or it can be broken up in other ways, but we're going to study them moving forward into the future. Yet another word that you're going to hear thrown around a decent amount is this idea of confounding. Confounding occurs in an experiment when the experiment is not able to distinguish between the effects of different factors. So going back to ice cream and drowning, confounding was happening. The temperature was confounding for us. It was a factor that was making it difficult for us to tell um, what kind of thing is happening with drowning ice cream and temperature. Like what, 
where's the the cause, right? Um, and so when we're setting up an experiment, we try really hard to plan the experiment so that confounding doesn't occur. Because if it does, then our experiment was kind of useless, right? Also, we've been throwing around this word cause because of the ice cream drowning thing. In general, if you see the word cause in a statistical thing, you should have red flags going off. Cause in causation and statistics, they don't go together. All right. But we'll be talking about that more later. All right. So let's talk about controlling effects of variables. All right. So when we're setting up an experiment, we can completely randomize in our experimental design. What we do here is we're going to assign subjects to different treatment groups through some process of random selection. We can do a randomized block design. What we'll do with this is we'll have a block that's a group of subjects that are similar, but the blocks might have something that makes them different with the outcome of the experiment. We also can do something called a matched pairs design. In this, we're going to take two people who have a lot of similarities. And we're going to say these two are paired together. We'll assign one to the experimental group one or treatment group and one to our um, control group. Or we'll potentially have more subjects that are all similar and we'll be like, you get treatment one, you get treatment two, etc. Um, and we also can have a rigorously controlled design, in which case we're going to assign subjects to different treatment groups so that everybody's given treatments in similar ways that are important to the experiment, but we're going to completely be controlling who gets what. All right, I can't stress this enough. Sampling errors are going to happen. No matter how well you design your experiment or how good you are at collecting sample data, it happens. Sampling errors happen. There's likely to be something come up at some point. All right. So let's talk about possible things that could come up. First one, just called sampling error or random sampling error. This happens when you've selected your sample using some kind of random method, which is considered a really good method for sampling. But there's some kind of discrepancy between the sample result and the population result. So it just, it happens, right? Our sample tells us something about the population and it's not actually what's true for the population. That happens sometimes. Another thing that could happen is what's called a non-sampling error. Non-sampling error is the result of human error, including things like wrong data entries, computing errors, questions that are biased, uh, false data that the respondents give you or the subjects give you. Uh, you form some kind of biased conclusions because of some bias that you have underlying in you as the experimenter. Um, or you might apply the statistical methods that are just are not appropriate for the circumstances. Non-sampling errors also happen. The final thing is a non-random sampling error. Non-random sampling error is the result of using a sampling method that's not random, such as using a convenience sample or a voluntary response sample. If I were trying to figure out how many students eat lunch on campus and I go and I stand outside of the dining hall to take my sample and ask them if they eat on campus or not, they're almost all going to say yes because they probably just finished doing so or are headed to do so. That's convenience sampling and I found out that 100% of students eat on campus, whereas there's likely not 100% of students eating on campus. So if I took my sample somewhere else or did a random sample, I would probably have a different result. All right, that's an example 
of non-random sampling error. So using these convenient samples or voluntary samples, it can lead to this.